Welcome to this live stream. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the art of the Rosetta mission and basically just going through what happened with Rosetta landing Philae on the comet and how that's inspired sci artists and their work. So first off, I want to introduce myself. I'm Kelly Stanford. I'm a science communicator from the University of Hull. Uh, and I think our guests would like to introduce themselves. Katarina, do you want to go uh, first? Sure. My name is Ekaterina Smirnova, and I am Russian, but I am now living in Seattle. I'm an artist, and my inspiration comes from science. So that's really a short introduction. <laughs> what else to say? <laughs> yeah, uh, Mark, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so I'm Mark McCorkran, and I work for the European Space Agency. And I am the senior advisor for science and exploration. Um, that spans all of what we do in all of the various astrophysical missions, the solar system missions, fundamental physics, but also human spaceflight and robotic exploration. And at the time of uh, Rosetta, the, the, the core part, the landing of Philae on the surface uh, in 2014, I was in charge of the um, outreach and communications group uh, for the science director at the European Space Agency. So the work you see here is represented, you'll see is representing a big team of people who worked on that, um, and who continue to work in communications for the European Space Agency, most of them. Excellent, right, let's get to the questions then. First off, it's going to be centered around 67P and Rosetta specifically. Uh, and then we're going to look at ESA's SciCom outreach like initiatives and stuff. So first off, I've got a question for Katerina. So you've centered your art around the Comet 67P. Can you tell us about how the project came about? Uh, was it just like you were interested in it, like you've seen it on the news, or were you approached by ESA? How did that happen? Well, first of all, I heard of this project via this uh, platform called, called Sloop. And I've been watching a live uh, viewing of lending of Phila to the comet. It was just one of those science uh, live streamings that I watched on that program. And it just inspired me so much. It was fascinating to me. How is it even possible to reach the distant comet? Not only that, but even land things on it. So I was immediately hooked. And I started painting um, my artwork based on the photography taken by Rosetta, which was already following the comet 67P for a while. And I've created, uh, uh, you know, some uh, paintings by them when Isa actually reached out to me saying like, hey, you're painting our comet. What, what do you want to you want to comment <laughs> on that? And this is how it all started. I uh, was in communication uh, with uh, Claudia Mignon, actually. Uh, her name is Claudia, and she helped me to get appointed with the science community exploring the comet. I was invited to participate in a, a science meeting in Amsterdam, and uh, well, it's Nordwijk, I think it's called, <laughs> the little uh, place. Um, so I traveled, I brought my paintings, and from that on, it just catapulted into the sky. This project became so much bigger uh, as an art project for me than I anticipated to begin with. So this is how really it all happened. I met Mark yeah. too. Mark, I remember when I met you, you were at ESA, you just biked a long distance to your work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you, you were dressed in, <laughs> in a biking outfit. <laughs> Yeah, well, yes, P many people will say, I mean, I think Matt Taylor said recently, I just saw him, Matt Taylor, the project scientist for Rosetta. Um, it's the first time I've seen him in uh, many months. And he said he didn't recognize me because I wasn't dressed in Lycra, cycling Lycra. So uh, for once, <laughs> it's yeah, probably true. I do spend a lot of lot of time dressed in Lycra. But, uh... <laughs> Barefoot, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Mark, apart from the, the Lycra, as we've already established, <laughs> As someone close to the mission and working at the European Space Agency, what is it like to see the science and the work you and your colleagues are close to represented like in such an artistic way? 
I think that's a good question because you know it's often very it's very easy to kind of get lost in in the the thing you're doing, and I think that's true of all of us, right? If you kind of have a uh, a job or a hobby or an obsession, it's very easy to sort of focus on that and forget the wider context. Um, and Rosetta had a very wide context. Um, in fact, maybe I can just sort of illustrate that by showing a couple of slides to begin with, because okay. you know, as I say, you you need to step back occasionally and see how much impact some of these things can actually have. So if I just share um, this little introduction here. So this is, you know, an artist impression uh, with a real photograph of the comet and then artist pictures of the two spacecraft Rosetta and Philae in the background. And I think, you know, just to remind everybody before we talk about the art and science, this is an amazing scientific mission in terms of trying to understand the origins of our own solar system by studying a primitive body um, but it reached out well beyond that. And I think that was, you know, partly the excitement of the mission, what it, what it was as an adventure, as a technical achievement, as a scientific endeavor, but also because people could relate to it through the communications that our team did. And then through people like Katerina, who did things on top of that, we didn't even dream of. I mean, Katerina a little bit, um, uh, hiding her light under a bushel there, because not only did she paint the comet, she painted it with water, which had been adulterated with extra deuterium to kind of mimic the comet. So it was it was really mixing the two things. But let me just sort of remind people of the influence that the mission had. You know, so the front cover of Science Magazine is the breakthrough of the year. Two Google Doodles, Andrea Accomazzo, one of the top 10 people uh, who mattered in 2014, according to Nature. And then just a couple of videos to show, you know, even how far in the zeitgeist it went. The, the end of year videos put together by Facebook and Google to show the influential events of the year. So let me just show you the first one, which is Facebook. The most powerful force on this planet is human cooperation. Stop defining each other by what we are not and start defining ourselves by who we are. We can all be freer. And then the Google one, which is got so I, you know, I could clip it a little bit more, but I found this little viral video interesting since it was also a highlight of 2014. Did you hear those words? Just rendezvousing with this comet is an extraordinary thing. We're going to make discoveries that no one's imagined yet. And that, you know, t that's a testament to the mission, and it even makes me emotional seven years later on, right, to be kind of that influential to have reached that many people. But that didn't just happen through the science and the technology. You know, it happened through the communications team, which I wanted to flag here. I mean, some really, um, you know, it, it, brilliantly creative colleagues who, who put a lot of effort into all of this. Oh, Katerina mentioned Claudia, but the whole team that you see there. Um, and, and, you know, working with artists to increase that outreach and that communications, I think was actually critical to it. It was not only the things that we did internally, but the things that were done um, by uh, by the people on the outside. And it, and it kind of gets a runaway at some point. You know, you're not in control of it anymore and you don't want to be. You just want people to be inspired and let people pick up on it. Um, and and we'll talk, I'll show you some other things that we did later on. But I think it, to go back to your original question, what it did was ground us in what we were doing, what the team was doing, and how important these kind of challenges can be when they're represented in a human artistic cultural way they extend well beyond just the pure science and technology exactly. uh, and it should be you know because we're paid by the taxpayer we're not it's not only about our narrow bubble so i mean katarina probably can talk to more about that because you know, why would people pick up on this well you know in my opinion art sometimes is easier to understand than scientific data so it needs to be in a way translated in some uh, form that is easier to even visually or hearing about something in, in a you know simple way. So for me, I'm acting really as an interpreter from science to non-scientists using art is, as my language. So I'm trying to implement science into my work too. That's why when you mentioned the water, for example, but yeah, there's a lot of things that I and I'm adding into the work because when the question comes, oh, why did you do that? Then I'm um, explaining about it to those who are asking and therefore I'm uh, writing their interest to science even further. 
and that's really how it works for me anyway <laughs> actually that uh leads into a question i wanted to ask why paint this comet over everything else in science well, the Comet 67B is indeed the, my muse for many years already. So it's been the major project, though um, I not only have focused on Rosetta mission, I work on other scientific discoveries and explorations. But the Comet 67B, it's my favorite comet ever, and it moves. <laughs> so first, I, what can I, how can I not paint it? And I always get, um, uh, photographic references from the Rosetta itself. There were so many beautiful, gorgeous photographs we've taken, and this is what I use usually to you know, to paint with. So I, I am in love with the comic, what can I say? And it's coming back this year. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's coming back, uh, what is it, next month? Is it like closest to the Earth? Yeah, it's <laughs> visible already. You can, people have been taking photographs of it, you know, with the tail and everything comes around every six and a half years, roughly. Um, and that, you know, again, that's how long it's been uh, since we were, not since the landing, that was before uh, closest approach um, to mm -hmm. the sun. Uh, it doesn't, it's not getting, you know, particularly close to the earth, for example, right? I mean, it's, we won't be a naked right. eye object. You won't yeah. be able to go out and look yeah. in the night sky. Everybody. But binoculars or, a, or an SLR camera, you should be able to take a photograph of it uh, over the coming coming weeks. Right, because it's not raining. It's raining here <laughs> yeah. uh, all the time. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Um, Mark, do you think representing 67P and more broadly the Rosetta mission helps communicate the science in a more, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to explain this, but in a more accessible way to the public than, you know, like general science communication might not be able to yeah be able to do yeah i think so i mean you, you, you know as, as i said before there's the mission itself has some special aspects about it um which which help in terms of communicating to the public there was this this journey this launch in 2004 this arrival in 2014 this kind of sense of jeopardy about would the spacecraft wake up after its hibernation um, and then only a few months later you arrive, you start to see the first pictures of a thing you've never seen before, right? I mean, it's not like, and I don't mean this in a demeaning way, it's not like yet another mission to Mars, right? Where we've been and we've seen it and it's a bunch of red rocks on the ground. I mean, it's, you know, there are many reasons to keep going there, but it was terra incognita, right? We had never seen it in any meaning. So every step you took getting closer was was revealing new features about this world um, and the small... shape of the comet yeah <laughs> that was yeah. surprising to everybody <laughs> yeah exactly that even that weird thing. thing that it turned out to be you know it's got a small head and a big body and and people kind of say it looks like a rubber duck i mean you can't plan that right you can't say <laughs> that we're going to make it look like a rubber duck and therefore get communication but once that happens then you can <laughs> explore Catherine has got one she prepared it yeah yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so and, and, and the, one of the things which I think is important, again, if I just share my screen again briefly, um, is that one of the things that people forget is this sort of beauty of having, well, so, so this is just so that everybody can go back and look at the full picture. We won't cover it all in an hour. We did actually write a full journal. Uh, and this is not just an article, it's a full journal in the Communicating Astronomy with the Public Journal about Rosetta and the things that we did. But one of the key things is this, right? Making cartoons, um, using the fact that there are two spacecraft and that they're together for a long time and then they separate and one goes to the surface. And, and then we had the adventure where Philae went to sleep and didn't communicate back with Rosetta. So you can create a human story um, which, which engaged many young kids, for example. But there was always that challenge of making sure that the cartoons were as scientifically realistic as possible in the sense of not trying, not lying about the way the mission actually played out. And this was not something we planned at the beginning. We, we made the first cartoon as part of a small sequence uh, of, mo of, of short movies about waking um, Rosetta up after the hibernation. But this one had the most traction. People kind of got into it immediately. And then we, 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 we went on from that. We made a whole series of cartoons. 25 minutes worth in the end and so that ability to you know um connect with people through in this case anthropomorphization right and and 
yeah, people kind of get, some people don't didn't like it because they felt it was trivializing the mission. But you have to remember that communications is not a one size fits all. You're trying to meet many different audiences with many different approaches. Some people just want lists of numbers about how comets are made and how the spacecraft is built out of metal. Some people bluntly weren't interested in any of that and they wanted to connect with the human side of the story. But you know, then you know, we, we go on, we, we we connected with lots of different artists and this is just part there's a um a tumblr site uh, that uh, claudia put together and there's loads and loads of different pieces of artwork there um contributed i mean you know, they they people were just doing amazing things because they were inspired like katarina and many others um <clears throat> and that also led us later on to doing um art residencies um in in collaboration here with ars electronica in europe and that's an, another level of connecting because it's in, more equivalent in a way to what Katarina did is how do I take the science and the mission and put, turn that into a piece of art that both informs and inspires, right? It's not, it's not pure pushing communication. It's a two-way dialogue. And these two artists, Aoife van Lindenthal and Sarah Petkus, they came to Eztec where we work in the Netherlands and they worked with the scientists and built up a rapport so it was a two-way thing right it was they were acting as kind of um, interlocutors between the public and us not us just pushing communications out so I think again you know there's a lot to be learned about opening yourself up to the lots of the many different avenues um, about you know how do you connect with an audience on something that could be quite esoteric um, and you have to take risks at some point you have to um, you have to gamble a bit and I'll talk a little bit about that later on some some of the bigger gambles that we took along the way. It's quite interesting you brought that Tumblr site up because I actually contributed a work to it. Right. <laughs> yeah because at the time when all this Rosetta stuff was going on I was in college doing my yeah my art <laughs> my art b-tech so I was basing my art around what was happening with Rosetta what was happening around CERN and stuff like that so that's quite nice to see that all again <laughs> yeah and just you know one last comment there I think you can plan all you like, right? But they, you know, they famously say, you know, plans don't survive first contact with the enemy. I don't mean that at all. In this case, it's the opposite. You know, plans with the public. By the time we finished all of this, the fact that the public were writing to us and and, and talking about how much it had touched them. I mean, again, it's it's easy to sort of feel that you should be taking credit for this. It became something much more than we ever did on our own. It became some kind of a community effort. And much of the inspiration came from the things that other people did. But when you get to the point where you get people sending you letters saying that they changed their career in their 40s and stopped being a lawyer and went back to college to do science or to do art. Um, and kids who had, had changed their whole attitude towards science. And there are even kids now. I heard from a friend, uh, uh, Richie Daly, in Waterford in Ireland. He, had, he was um, educating primary school children, so seven, eight, nine year old. Uh, no, a bit older than that, maybe around 10, <clears throat> um, showing them Rosetta and Philae through the mission. The first one of those kids has now gone to college in, in Dublin to study astrophysics. I mean, so it, it makes me feel old. It's a long time ago. But, you know, that's when you touch people, right? That's when you change people's lives. And that's just so humbling to have been part of that. I know that's like really heartwarming to actually hear that it has actually influenced people to get into you know science or you know change their perspective on what they can do in their art to try and show science in their art as well i mean i know personally it had massive impact in, on myself and my viewpoint of what i want to do with my art hence why i went full-on sci artist and i've still stuck with that till today yeah. um so yeah it's really really i'm probably well enough of it actually <laughs> it's quite an emotional topic for myself um but yeah katarina one last question uh so we can wrap up this little portion of the interview um have you got any plans to continue this rosetta project on because obviously the uh, the mission created so much data so much material that like scientists are still combing through it, i believe till now so i was wondering whether you wanted to jump back in and you know 
see how you interpret it differently than what you did back then. Yes, I do have plans to continue. And as a matter of fact, I have continued this year as for return of the promise, I've created new artwork. And this time, uh, though, I'd like to address a question of how important comets are for forming life on planet Earth. As of course, we don't know the origin of life on Earth, but there are a lot of data that was collected and even via the Rosetta mission that makes you think that possibly comets have a lot to do with forming life. We wouldn't be sitting here and uh, having a conversation, international conversation via <laughs> Zoom if it wouldn't be for the comets perhaps. Because not only did comets bring a lot of water to planet Earth, um, because mostly they are made out of um, ice and dust. So, but they also brought important ingredients like uh, phosphorus, which is just crucial for life forming and uh, amino acids, glycine, I believe, was found on the comet 67P in particular, and multitude of organic molecules. So that in a good environment, when the earth was cooling off, potentially all of these ingredients mingled together and started this really basic form of life. And so for this new work that I've done this year, I decided to not only create that special water that Mark has mentioned, which I uh, generally use electrolysis to um, increase the level of heavy water in the regular water, and then using that water to paint the comet. But I decided to create actually uh, uh, colonies of bacteria and add that yet into the water as, as well to you know represent that the possibility of the life uh, that is starting via the comets. So I actually have prepared a little video to show you the process of me creating this artwork for this year. I'm going to share it with you. Okay. Just give me a second. Here I'm showing that I'm um, generating water via electrolysis. You can see the separation of oxygen and uh, hydrogen. I sampled actually the little uh, 3D printed comet that I showed you earlier and got bacteria from directly from, from that and were colonies uh, in the petri dishes. And I basically added uh, to the water. There's a lot of splashing in my work, and uh, this is all for the active part of the comet's journey when the comet gets closer to the sun and it ejects all of this uh, streams of water that is melted with the sun applied to create this feel of cometary tail behind the comet. Uh, I splash a lot. I'm also adding a little <laughs> different effect for the artwork to make it look different from um, the world that I've done before. I'd like to also point out that the music that you're hearing on the background is uh, Lee. Motram, he is a clarinetist uh, from 
uh, Ireland of, uh, from England. And so he, he was yet another uh, artist and a musician, a collaborator, who I've inspired to compose specifically for this project. We've met, have been in, to New York. I've lived in New York for many years. And he traveled with me also to ISA to, while I was presenting my work and uh, played live. So he's composed music inspired by the, the sonifications of the comet uh, by many, many of the uh, sim, right? Mike, <laughs> my remembering the name of. Um, so it, there's this project is so diverse. I decided that just one media uh, as a watercolor is not enough. So I have to really study comets from different senses. So if paintings would be a representation of the visual sense, then there is also, we have so many. We have hearing, we have um, taste and smell. So uh, even there was that card that was created with the smell of the comet 67P. Oh, which I, I have I, one of those. Oh, I have one of those. Yeah, it's, it stinks a lot. It, it's, yeah. not the most, it's not the most, you know, it, the, the smell goes through everything, plastic bags, and they have traveled, you know, internationally flying, and then by the time I arrived, my whole luggage smelled like a comet. <laughs> so there is, it's not only for you as scientists to explore the comet and, and get so much data, but also for me as an artist, I, I feel like I have to be implementing different media to make it more diverse and cover all sorts of aspects of the discoveries of the comet. So that I would like to continue, of course. I don't think this project is done. There, I think there is scientists still, uh, data is being still analyzed. So the comet is going to be coming back, P, and the com comet 67P stands for periodic. So it comes back every uh, six and a half years. So it will continue, for sure. And just to keep you busy, we're now building another comet mission called Comet Interceptor, uh, which will <laughs> rendezvous, effectively go and loiter in space and wait for a comet which may not be periodic, maybe just a once in a lifetime uh -huh. comet, uh, which would come from the outer solar system, or even if we're lucky, from uh, another solar system, uh, uh, an interstellar yeah. comet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And being able to, we won't be able to land on it because of the difference in velocity, but to fly past it and see one of these even more primitive objects. Um, so that, yeah, that'll be coming along in a few years time. So plenty to keep you busy. Oh boy. I'm curious to find out like if you can catch what other organic materials are present on that comet, just to see like what, what brought us here. Are we from solar system or are we, uh, from much further? <laughs> that would be exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one last question as well, Katerina. I was just wondering, do you actually have a background in science? Uh, or is it just something that you've gone into as you've explored the topic with your art? Well, I'm one of those that Mark mentioned earlier. I actually am a lawyer <laughs> who switched to being an oh. artist. My education is law, which I don't practice anymore. Uh, yeah, so I don't have any scientific education, though I get a lot of inspiration uh, starting from my father, who is an engineer, absolutely phenomenal engineer. And so uh, since childhood, this, plus I, I was born in the USSR, you know, <laughs> so space was a big thing in, in my country. And so uh, we, we all, all of the boys wanted to be uh, Yuri Gagarin, uh, you know, the first man in space, yeah. or a firefighter. But, you know, <laughs> that, that's really, uh, for me, I um, study science on my own, you might say. And I try to do a lot of research before I proceed with an art project. I don't want to make any mistakes. If I'm not sure, then I'll get in touch with scientists and ask scientists directly their opinion on that. So. As, as for the cartoon um, that you mentioned, Mark, you don't also, you don't want to give wrong data, wrong information to the public. For me, the same way. Yeah. Yeah. I was just uh, also wondering, have you tackled any other scientific, like, topics with your art, Katharina? 
Is there any like other missions you've tried tackling? Um, um, I don't understand the question. Um, any um, missions? Like any other, like, have you done work on other space missions or is it just Rosetta? Right, no, I, I have done work in the past as well as uh, right now. I'm following Bepi Colombo, uh, the mission to Mercury. I've actually, while visiting ESA uh, with my work for Rosetta, I have had a chance to see the spacecraft being built and now it is really close already approaching mercury by now and so i am uh following this mission i've met scientists from isa as well as uh, jaxa a japanese space agency because it is a collaboration project so uh using that data once we get to mercury i will start working on that but at the moment this flying by earth and venus it's a long journey as usual, of course, it's very complex. Also, um, I've done some ceramic uh, sculptures for Lisa Pathfinder, which is the um, gravitational waves exploration, also project by ESA as well. And I, I met uh, also scientists for uh, gravitational waves exploration from LIGO. Um, so the, the Rainier Wise, uh, he works at MIT, the Nobel Prize winner who actually has detected the first gravitational waves. So uh, there are many, there's so much science really. It's uh, hard to really like pick one project and stick with it, you know? So I like to work on the various projects. So I, I just note we, we have actually flown past Mercury for the first time uh, with Bepi Colombo. That was uh, on the first of October, but that's the first of six flybys. So we we you know we right. we loop it's around until yeah. two, two, 2025. But yeah, the, it was amazing to see the first images come back from Mercury a few weeks ago, and uh, and and you know in kind of the name of art and science, work with some musicians in the UK um, uh, commissioned a piece to actually some, some a short piece of music which goes with the animation. Uh, Anil Sebastian and, and uh, Ingmar Kamalagaran, uh, you know, just again, continuing the art and science collaboration there, even on something very short, just a day's event. But uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. good stuff. We're there finally. I have a bunch of questions actually for you, Mark. Okay. So firstly, you've, you've briefly touched on this, but I was just wondering as a whole, how does the European Space Agency engage with like sci artists, uh, you know, to communicate like the research and these different projects, like is there like a yearly thing that ESA runs similar to what EGU runs each year, you know, with the artist residency, uh, for example? Yeah, so we've done things on an ad hoc basis in the past. Um, and, and, you know, there've been a number of events around the agency, different places, because of course we're spread around Europe. So sometimes these things have been local um, in, in one country or the other. Uh, the thing I showed you a couple of moments ago uh, with Sarah Peckus and Aoife van Linden Toll was a competition which we ran with Ars Electronica, who are based in Linz in, in Austria. And yeah. so that was open to the world. Uh, and we got some really interesting people applying for that. You know, we only had two slots to give away. Um, and we wanted to continue with that. But due to all sorts of internal things at ESA, we didn't manage to do it straight away. But uh, by the end of or the middle of 2019, we had said, look, we've got really got to kick off something regular here. So working with uh, Karen O'Flaherty, who is in, was involved in the ESA comms team uh, for Rosetta, and one of the project scientists, Kate Isaac, who is uh, the project scientist for our KOPS mission, a small exoplanet mission, um, we had set up to establish a new art residency. And then, of course, coronavirus happened. Uh, and we want to have people on site. We think it's important that it not be virtual, that people get the chance to interact with the scientists and the engineers and actually, you know, take something away tangible from having been there. So we kind of postponed it for a while until uh, very recently, actually. And in fact, I think the deadline is still open. We have opened a near term restricted one, which is available only to artists resident in the Netherlands. And we've done that purely for pragmatic reasons that we can inside a country, it's easier to ensure they'll be able to travel here because we just don't know, you know, what might happen in the next six months. 
Um, but that so that's open and that's collaborating with people called um, the Science Gallery in Rotterdam and also the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. So we're looking at astrobiology, life, um, you know, how to looking at from the biology perspective, the astrophysics perspective. But the intention then is to open that up uh, it fully internationally again and have it be a regular call annually. Um, once we got this first pilot out of the way, so to speak, uh, that sounds sounds negative. Out of the way, we, that, we, we, we we're doing it that way first. Um, but the intention from the beginning was to restart these because we found them really rewarding, both for us and for the artists. Um, I mean, it certainly Katarina has talked eloquently about you know how it kind of changed her life, and the same is true with some of the other people we work with. And I don't you know. I, I don't mean that in the sort of sense that we are the holders of some magic information which changes people's life. It's it's a dialogue. And the great thing about having artists with us is some of the scientists to begin with are a little bit skeptical. Why should I talk to an artist? You know, what am I going to get from this? I'm busy. I've got a mission to run. But I know that when they sat uh, and talked and, and got that perspective, so to speak, they were very enthusiastic about it and came away with some really interesting ideas about how the public view their mission as well and what their not res responsibilities I guess you would call it um, how do you think outside the box and how do you go about communicating so yeah we, we, we do things in an ad hoc basis um, mission by mission sometimes center by center but I am you know really hoping that we can actually establish a much more regular thing as you say like EGU CERN have done this ESO do this other big uh, research organizations um, it, you know it, it's not rocket science we should be able to work with artists pretty pretty regularly yeah actually yeah. I wanted to touch on an, a little event that you've put on called Space Rocks do you want to uh, talk a bit about that yeah uh, let me just quickly pan through a couple more of these slides just so I can get to the end because yeah, you know, that, yeah. that, that, will, that will inform uh, Space Rocks a little bit yeah. I mean one of the things that we did um, during Rosetta as well one thing now that we commissioned is that people were you know saying oh you need to create some kind of audio visual experience to go with it a bit equivalent to this this is the very famous these are stills from the famous NASA film called the seven minutes of terror which accompanied um, the landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars in 2012 and it's a kind of very it's very exciting but it's a very engineering driven film it says you know what do we have to do we have to get through the atmosphere we have to deploy the parachute we have you know use the heat shield parachute thrusters you know drop the rover onto the surface and when it came to rosetta we felt we needed to do something like that but we also realized that the filet descent towards the comet was not seven minutes of terror going through the atmosphere but it's kind of seven hours of boredom you know nothing happening right i mean <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's and if you're being realistic, there's no sound, unlike on Mars, where it's perfectly legitimate because there's an atmosphere. You can have the, th the thrusters and everything else. The comet was just a silent movie in that sense. So we decided to sort of take a big risk and, and do something completely different. And that was to make a science fiction film about the mission. I'm not going to show it, but I'm going to just show some of the storyboard and, and concept art which went into it. It's a film called Ambition, um, and the idea is that this is sort of set in the deep future. This is the picture behind me here. Uh, we filmed it in Iceland um, with Aidan Gillen from Game of Thrones and Ashling Franciosi, who was later in Game of Thrones. Um, so it had some sort of bit of a celebrity pull. But the idea was, you know, this, this thing, this theme about did comets bring water to Earth and did they potentially bring life to Earth? And this was all before... Um, we'd actually uh, arrived at the comet and and so you know it was a lot of extrapolation um, and as I say this concept art about how you would represent some kind of nanotechnology so it's all very you know woo woo science fiction but we tried to keep it as as what's the word not realistic but as as informative as possible there is a central question about this mission and how can we use science fiction to draw in a completely new audience as a consequence so as i say we ended up filming it in iceland on this barren landscape uh, some brilliant work done by a polish company called platija marge uh, atomic baginski who's ne who has subsequently go gone on to be the showrunner on the witcher uh, oscar nominated director it's amazing that we could get these people involved because they wanted to work on something that wasn't selling soap, right? It wasn't just about an ad, a, you know, a commercial for selling a product. And, and we made some interesting things. So you can find the films online. There's a trio of films. There's a teaser trailer, there's the main film, and then there's an epilogue, which was two years later. 
Um, but we also made a making of film which talks about the inspiration behind the story and alternate stories and, and, and the ways that um, the, we tried to bring the art and science together. And there's a beautiful moment at the end of the film where it said, you know, one of the artists that worked on it said, you know, it's absolutely crazy that we have to make a science fiction film to get people engaged in something that is utterly brilliant. <laughs> you know, that, you know, what, that's nuts, right? It should just be something people are interested in. But, you know, I'm, I'm still very proud of that because it was a risk out of the box. And there was some really very, you know, great feedback that won lots of prizes and lots of people said, you know, you've kind of changed the discourse about science communication. But but there was also music. There was custom music made for it. And this is bringing me on to the Space Rocks thing. So actually, there was there was the main album for Ambition. The film itself is only seven minutes long, but there's a full album by Atanas Falkov there. Um, a guy called John Crossley in the UK did a whole uh, show of his music. And then Ed Blakely did a classical album called The Rosetta Suite. So these are all available. And, they're, you know, again, ambition was sort of for the mission but the others people just did them like Katarina did what she did and then we went to the point so this is a still from Blade Runner of course um, and one of the most sort of well-known science fiction composers uh, historically is Vangelis who did the music for Blade Runner and he made a full album about Rosetta as well so you know I, my, my brother is an artist uh, a visual artist uh, uh, and uh, installation work but I have to say my brain is mostly triggered by music um, that's where you know if, for me the ultimate emotion in art comes from music um, and so the, the the thing that we oh there's I think there's a bit of, of it's going to play some music here so maybe I don't want to play that right now let me jump ahead of that so yeah um, jumping from that we got hooked up with a guy called Alex Milas in the, in the UK. And Alex, uh, at the time, was the editor of, or the, the chief executive officer of a, a bunch of people called Team Rock. And they published um, um, music magazines, uh, Prog Magazine, uh, Metal Hammer, and various other uh, classic rock. And he was inspired, and he got in touch with us through Matt Taylor. Uh, Matt Taylor was uh, the project scientist. And over time, we decided we wanted to do something which brought together scientists, engineers artists musicians and that led to space rocks um so we we've done two big live events in london and you can see we've got astronauts we've got musicians we've got science fiction authors uh and we do a series of things where we you know we'll talk about real science so you know we've got tim peak on stage talking about what it means to go to space as an astronaut uh shahzad timon uh here talking about uh, working on robotics in space and we had other people talking about dark matter um, people talking about Bepi Colombo and Mercury and we also had celebrities along so we've got in the bottom left corner there we've got Jason Isaacs uh, from Star Trek and also from uh, the Harry Potter films Lucius Malfoy um, uh, Dominique Tipper from The Expanse uh, and and you know pulling people together to create an entertainment plus information a day now flip side to that is of course in the last a uh, year and a half, we haven't been able to do live events. So what we have done is continue it online. Uh, this is a bit of advertising, but we've done 58 of these episodes of what we call Uplink. So things like this, with, in dialogue with people from music, from art, from poetry, from engineering, from climate change, to Bepi Colombo, to Rosetta, uh, how you fly a spacecraft, uh, the science you do there. Um, and we've had Apollo astronauts, we've had Vangelis himself, we've had Nobel Prize winners. And so it's been amazing to keep that going over the last uh, uh, 18 months. And, and we'll certainly do more. But we're really looking forward to going back to physical live events as well. So, uh, yeah, Space Rocks has been a great way of us connecting with a wider range of, of, of artists, extending beyond what effectively started with Rosetta. Yeah, so are you going to plan on doing an in-person event next year or yeah so you know obviously we've been a bit we've probably been more cautious than some people about going back to live events the first two big space rocks events were in uh, in the uk in london at the o2 um and we'll go back there again definitely but we're the european space agency so we have a remit to do this not just in the uk 
Um, so in fact, we would we you know without giving too many secrets away about exactly where and when. Before lockdown, uh, we were in Poland uh, looking at venues for a big event there, working with our friends who worked on the science fiction film. Um, and so, you know, and we've got lots of inquiries, Germany, France, Italy, Spain. Uh, we'll definitely be going back to live events. But as I say, probably in 2022, we won't be doing one before the end of this year. And one final question for you, Mark, before we go on to the Q&A section. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you do art yourself. I mean, I was looking at your website last night <laughs> and I was quite shocked that it turns out you photographed David Bowie <laughs> in concert and yeah, they're well, really good photographs. Yeah, I'm old. Uh, what can I say? Um, yeah, I was a, uh, when I was a student, so this is, we're talking about the 80s now, right? Uh, I was a, I, I worked at the Edinburgh Festival as a photographer. Um, for the for the thing called the Festival Times, um, photographing all of the acts, uh, you know, going to venues and doing things also at their at where they were living. But I was a yeah I was a concert photographer for a while, and so those pictures of Bowie that you saw from uh, from Murrayfield in 1983, and weirdly a couple of weeks ago somebody published on Twitter put a picture of Bowie just before he went on stage at that gig and uh, black and white picture. He's standing in that you know beautiful Let's Dance suit, which are in my pictures. And the amazing thing is that I am just out of shot because we were standing in the tunnel as he walked past us to go on stage at that, at that gig. So I, you know, I photograph you two on their first tour. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I also photograph Kajagoogoo, but you know, and loads of other <laughs> bands, what can I say? Um, yeah, so I know I'm really interested in in photography, and I've done lots of concert photography over the years. But just you know, these days, too, purely as an as an amateur. But you mentioned the art thing. I'm just going to reach out a screen here for a second. Um, one of the one of the projects. <clears throat> so as I said, I'm, I work with musicians on putting music over some of our videos that we make. Mm. Um, and through Space Rocks, I've come to get to know um, Anna Phoebe. She's a violinist based in the UK, uh, has worked with many bands, but also is a, a composer in her own right. And um, so during lockdown, I was just mucking around with my phone and garage band and, and just making noises, synthesizer noises, something I've done forever. I, I can't play anything, but I can make noises. Um, and she... This is her album, which just came out. Uh, I'm going to call it Sea Souls. I was going to call it Sea Songs, but it, you know, this is actually you know, an album full of song stuff. And one of the tracks on there, she took some of my noises, some of my soundscape stuff, and it's incorporated into the track. So you know, I'm kind of uh, know, pretty cool. Also, um, on the same album is Phil Manzanera from Roxy Music, and I'm thinking this is nuts, right? That my little noises are on the same album with a real musician or lots of real musicians. So yeah, it, for me, uh, my art is photography um, and mucking around on a synthesizer. I can't paint anything and I can't play anything properly, but uh, I leave that to the professionals and the inspired amateurs who do it way better than I can. Okay, we're going to move on to the... Just keep on uh, trying. Sorry. Well, yeah, I leave it to my brother. He, 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 my brother's a real artist. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Yeah, so we're running out of time a bit here, so let's sure. swiftly move to the Q&A section. Uh, so if you've got any questions you want to ask either Katerina or Mark, please get them in as soon as possible so we can go through them. Uh, while we're waiting for those to go in, um, I've got one question for both of you. Uh, is there a takeaway message or a piece of advice you... You want to give people who are interested in engaging in science and art. Katerina, go first. Well, I, from my perspective, I would say that if you'd like to, as a, if you are an artist and you would like to work in a sci art sphere, then don't be afraid to get attached to a scientist. Because they are open, they, they are also human beings like you are. They, they actually have a lot in common, scientists and artists. So they are, would be really open to perhaps answer your questions or even help you with something. Because they're also curious, so what are you doing and why are you contacting me? So it's, it's all possible, it's all doable. You can easily get collaborations with scientists if you're an artist. Yeah. 
and I would just I would mirror that and say, you know, I'm working on with with I don't know at the moment probably ten different artists and musicians uh, on various projects, and they've 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 made the connection. And some sometimes it's just you know, can you advise me on how to get a particular image or a particular piece of data which I can then build into my art? And others are saying, I just want to do something. What would be an interesting topic? So. I mean, and, and we have a whole range of kind of the, the planetary missions, the solar system missions, where you kind of go somewhere and you see something. And there are some which are much more abstract. And Katerina talked about gravitational waves, for example, you know, ripples in space time. That's a that's a whole different sort of level of abstraction. Um, yeah. And and it's not just the space science. There's also the 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 human exploration, the robotic exploration, Earth observation. Anna Phoebe put together a beautiful piece of music about looking down at the Earth and what what you can learn from from above. Um, and yeah, I, I think in, on both sides have an open approach to that relationship because you might go in as a scientist saying this artist can do this, but don't commissioning art is great. I mean, I'm all for it, right? Because it, there's obviously artists don't live on fresh air alone. I mean, the financial side is important mm -hmm. um, and you can commission art and do that. But I, in some ways, I'm much more interested in being open minded and saying, well, here are some things we do. How does that inspire you? rather than saying, I want a painting of this, because that might not be the best outcome, right? It might not be the most demanding. Exactly. And the, and the other way, reversing completely, the artist should come in with an open mind and say, well, I know you build spacecraft, but what are the technologies? What, what does it mean to be a human working on these things? What, what is the yeah. sense of discovery as, a, as much as the mecha mechanics, mechanics of discovery? Right? Sorry, did you want to add to that, Katarina? Or no, I agree. You know, the the way it goes is that perhaps artists inspire scientists to you know, come up with the space missions. Questioning originally, is that even possible to go to space? You know, a, an artist would come up with some this magical image of some distant planet. The scientist would think about it, look at it at the picture and decide, oh, is there an atmosphere on that planet? Why don't we go and explore? So it is mutually important. I think the, the two spheres, one is so abstract and imaginary and the other one is so precise um, and you know detailed. They yet have to go together, I believe. That's why this collaboration between art and science I think it's a, an important thing. We should just continue and encourage it. So anybody who wants to work in a sci art sphere, it's just great. We fully support. <laughs> okay, I've got one question for you, Katarina, and then sadly we'll have to end because we are running out of time <laughs> quite a bit. So Katarina, the question is, what art supplies do you use? Like, for example, what types of paints do you use? Uh, mm. Is it strictly painting? Do you do sculpture? Do you want to right. elaborate on that? Yeah, the different media, absolutely, depending on the project, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, some, some media is better for one project, some better for another. Ceramics, I love ceramics. Um, watercolor is, well, yeah, you call it the water media, really, because I mix my water uh, colors myself and uh, various collaborations you know I also implemented augmented reality into the work as well it just depends on the project you never know what am I gonna choose for the next project I, I don't have any uh, media that I stick with maybe I'm more known as for watercolor paintings in large scale but otherwise I'm absolutely oh, so dependent. all of those are like all the uh, Rosetta paintings are actually watercolor I thought there was a um, oil you know like really no. thinned out no. oil water oh. made sense to work with water because water is important yeah. <laughs> for the comet you know comet brought the water to planet earth yeah so water media is making sense Awesome. Um, so sadly, I'm going to have to end it here because we are running out of time. Uh, but thank you so much, everyone, for coming along. Thank you so much to Mark and Katharina for going through all these questions and, you know, opening dialogue between science and art. Um, we are going to be running a dedicated SciArt session again next year um, as part of EGU 2022. So if you want to take part in that, you can submit your abstracts 
hopefully early next year. Um, and if we're double lucky, we might have it in person. So you might be able to exhibit some work as well. Um, so yeah, please uh, keep your eyes peeled on the official like, EGU website and also EGU's Twitter account where they'll be giving out updates on all these sort of things and also announcing an open calls for each ses session, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, thank you, bye. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Bye, Katerina, bye. Bye, Mark. Bye, Kelly.